You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. My name is Terrence Doyle. And I'm Chris Lopez. You probably know us from the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Ride Along Show. Well, now we're talking everything multifamily. We bring in top industry experts from around the country to come join us in our Denver studio for an in-depth, in-person conversation. We're gonna be diving deep into deals, underwriting, raising capital, and everything in between. Join the conversation. Welcome back to another Tribe of Multifamily Mentors show here at Bigger Pockets. My name is Chris Lopez, and this show is about two things, multifamily and mentorship along the way. That's what we're going to talk about. We have a great guest, but first, my co-host, Terrence Doyle. Terrence, how are you, my man? Chris, the intros are really improving. Fantastic work out of you there. I can tell the practice is paying off. Yeah, I'm super excited about our guest today. We got a 25-year-old rock star. He's more of an entrepreneur, I would say, than just strictly real estate, but he's definitely done a bunch of multifamily real estate, uh, has some killer new technology and software coming out, and just an overall, in my opinion, super impressive dude, David Tupin from Austin, Texas. Welcome to the Tribe of Multifamily Mentors. Dude, I've got a lot to live up to after that uh, introduction. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's I, all true. I, I mean, appreciate it's, it. It's all true. That's I appreciate great. it. Yeah. No, you guys are great. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, we had the audience send in some questions and, you know, I think what's really impressive about you and some of the other guests that we're having on is this idea that you can start in real estate so young, no money, no experience. And so, you know, I just want the audience to start the story and the interview off with, you know, how did you initially get into multifamily? What initially piqued your interest to get you started at such a young age? Yeah. So I started in college. I was doing some internships in consulting, investment banking, and somebody, uh, you know, real estate was always in the back of my head. I'd been an entrepreneur since I was 13. I started a landscaping company. And so um, I always knew I wanted to have my own business. I didn't exactly know what it would be, um, but real estate had always kind of been in the back of my head. Uh, and so uh, w- one of my fellow interns at uh, this uh, iBank that I worked for uh, told me to check out Podcasts. This is in like twenty early twenty sixteen before podcasts were. I, I guess what had it had real mainstream. Yeah, yeah before yeah. they're really mainstream. Right. And uh, I went straight to the real estate section, and I found Bigger Pockets, which is ironic because that's you know now the show that we're on. And um, I it it I was hooked. I heard. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was I heard an a interview um, from one of my first mentors talking about the show. He's my first mentor ever. Uh, Steve Mills, he was on an r- early episode of Bigger Pockets, and he lived like, or he was investing in a market that was like 10 minutes from where I had, was living in college at the time. And for me, it was like, somebody in my backyard's doing this, I can definitely do this. And so he suggested at the end of the show, like pretty much everyone else, read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I read it and I was hooked. That was game over. Wow, that's really cool. So you're hooked. You've read Rich Dad Poor Dad. You have a mentor. So talk to us about you're going to college. You're a freshman, I think. You're working, you're going to school, you're studying, you're, you're researching LoopNet at night. I mean, tell us about the the work that went into getting your first deal and then actually being able to execute your first deal Yeah. while you're in college. Yeah. So it was a little, I'd gone through freshman, sophomore year. It was kind of a little towards the end of college, or junior year. Um, and I was, uh, I'd gotten out of a couple internships. I had already decided I wanted to do real estate full time. So I'd turned down all the job offer. I had a, I had one job offer that was like just over six figures and I turned them down on the spot. I was like, there's no way, because I know from what I've heard on podcasts, the, op- the opportunity is endless of what we, what I could do in real estate. And, um, and so I, dude, I was spending so much time just researching, uh, real estate, going to meetups, meeting people. Um, Steve, my first mentor, he would like, he's flipping houses and buying small commercial stuff. I would go meet him at job sites, like, dude, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it type of thing. And just learning for a while. Um, and I had a limiting belief in my head, uh, that I had to do single family before I could go and do multifamily. Wow. And so I first started, I wholesaled deals and I wholesaled, it was very short. That's why I don't talk about it a lot. It was maybe like four months and I did like five deals and I didn't make a ton of money. But he did deals, which is impressive. A lot of people get in wholesale and they can't say they can say I spent five months to zero deals. I did a couple of, yeah. So that was impressive. Yeah. And I linked up with a guy locally that was the buyer. And so it was easy. And he was like, he was basically like, dude, call these lists and do this to that. And I, I did and I hustled and I tracked down some deals, negotiated them and he would buy them. And I did a couple of those. And then 
very quickly I realized this is another day job. Right. If I stop working, my income stops. Like there's no equity in this. There's no wealth. And so I stopped it almost immediately. I was like, I'm doing multifamily. Like once you realize that, it was like, oh, oh yeah. the flip switch. Oh my gosh. Have you ever read uh, Donald Trump's book, uh, Art of the Deal? Yes. You know how he starts, he starts the book off, he's like, I like to do deals. Right. And his voice yeah. is like, yeah. big deals. Yeah. <laughs> you know how he says it? <laughs> and so that's how, that's how he talks. I, I, I literally feel the same way. Right. I always wanted to do really big deals. Yeah. And so it just excited me to be like, and so um, I started looking on LoopNet and talking to brokers and I had a base of knowledge. I mean, I kind of understood multifamily, but for me, what made it easy was that it just made sense. It's I'm looking at an income statement and it makes this, it makes X amount. I'm spending Y in expenses and I've got my NOI and that's how I determine my future value if I can increase it. And so... I was building spreadsheets and analyzing deals and talking to brokers and stuff. And and about how many hours do you think you had put in with all this practice and listening to podcasts, research, reading, doing spreadsheets, looking at LoopNet? Yeah. I mean, how many hours actually went in before you did a deal and made a single dollar? It, it was probably if, when I started looking at deals in uh, July, August of 2016, I had my first deal under contract in January of uh, 17. So probably six months of literally 80 hours a week nonstop. And I wasn't making any money. It was all hustling for that. Besides a couple of the wholesale deals I did, it was all hustling for finding that first apartment deal. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I'd love to highlight with our guests, you know, that have done, you know, fantastic things like yourself is, you know, what is the work that gets done behind the scenes? You know, what are you doing in the gym on the weekends when no one's there and, you know, there's no fans, there's no, you know, no LinkedIn, no post, you know, what is the actual like nitty gritty work that has to go in to get to that point? It's not glamorous, but it's super fundamental and essential to being able to be successful. Yeah. I think at my core, I really do, you know, now it's easier to see it, but I really love the process and I mm -hmm. love the hustle and like, and, and, and working toward like, that's yeah, fun. Totally. Me, right? Absolutely. More, I don't celebrate when I close a big deal and we make right. a lot of money. Right. Now I like, I love just, I just have fun the whole time. <laughs> and, but the, dude, there were, there were definitely times where I was like driving home at like one in the morning after I just worked 18 straight hours looking right. for deals. So yeah. I, dude, I just feel defeated. I remember one time I had gone, uh, and this was after I closed on, uh, I think my first deal or two and I had gone like five straight months. I'd made like 70 offers on, and I had um, like three deals where I was so close to signing an agreement and then somebody came in and like stole the deal. I remember driving home that night like one in the morning and I just like broke down crying because I'd been working for like Dude, a year, like literally, if you can imagine working 90 to 100 hours a week, every week, nonstop, like I had left all my friends. I lost a girlfriend because of it, like wow. everything. Yeah. And making very little money to no money. I was making no money. No I, made, money. I made like $20,000 my first whole 12 months of being in business. And then this just probably like kicked you in the gut a few times. Oh, dude. And I just kicked in the gut over and over again. And I, like, I knew I wasn't going to stop, but it's like, dude, this sucks. And I was just defeated. How but, many months and how many offers? I, it there? had to have been, I don't know the exact number. It had to have been like approximate. This is like mid 2017 before, right before I bought my next deal. And it's always darkest before the dawn. Right. <laughs> right. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, it had to have been five months of just like getting hammered. Just constantly I, put, putting offers yeah. out there, not getting accepted. Yeah. yeah. So what advice can well. you give? Because that's, I mean, that is a, a combination of like, you got to have like your, your mental game yeah. dialed in. And you also just have like your day-to-day -day routine mm -hmm. dialed in. Like what advice do you give for people who are in that trenches right now? Because all go through spots where it's like, holy crap, yeah, what am I doing? Sucks. Like how do you get through that? And what advice do you give? I think you just have to see the long term of what we're doing and what you're doing, right? And for me, I know I'm not gonna. It's not a get rich quick, and if you go into expecting that, um, you're never gonna win, and you're gonna feel super depressed. And and I actually talk about this at some events and when I speak, uh, entrepreneurship, and this goes separate from real estate, but entrepreneurship in general and running a business um, emotionally can be a serious roller coaster. I know you guys know it's yeah, no joke, sure. right? And 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 you could be the most excited one day, and the next day you're at the freaking bottom, right? And I started noticing this, and I think, and I like telling this because this has made me a more powerful entrepreneur today. What I noticed was the higher I got, the more excited I got, the more 
amped up I got, the lower the lows were. Like if I got like so excited, like, dude, I found this great deal. I think it's going to be awesome. I spent like all day underwriting it. And then like the next day it falls through and I'm like, just crushed, man. Um, what I noticed was the higher the highs were, the lower the lows were. And so when I learned to control my emotions about real estate, look at it as a long-term game, like think like freaking Warren Buffett, you know? Like that dude's not getting emotional over anything because his game is a set. He's playing a 70 year game or whatever. Um, I started really getting into a groove and being like, Hey, there's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. But if I can just try and keep it steady, a steady up instead of woo, woo, up and down, up and down, I'm going to be much better off. And once I learned kind of to tame that, I felt, uh, you know, I was, dude, it was a superpower. Yeah, it's a long horse race. I mean, this yeah. whole thing, I mean, relationships with brokers is a long horse race. I mean, there's brokers I can think of right now that I've been trying to build a relationship with. Because, you know, as you go from like smaller multifamily yeah. to medium size to larger, you know, the brokers sure. get different. So the relationships you used two years ago, you know, don't apply, you know, with where, you know, you and I yeah. are trying to go the next step. And yeah, I mean, it's it's it can be really discouraging. Yeah. You know, maybe you just don't click with them as well. Or, you know, maybe the way they communicate is a little different than what you're used to. And you're yep. not their favorite anymore. You kind of have to start over. Yep. And, uh, it's like you, you know, just went two weeks without talking to them and they gave a deal to somebody totally, else or whatever. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And so you really have to. And that's what I keep telling myself is just if I'm just steady, if I'm consistent, consistent if I do what I say yeah. I'm going to do over the course of time, yeah. I will, you know, move up, you know, his food chain. 100%. But it man, it can be discouraging, you know, yep. and it's a uh, it's definitely a relationship, long horse, long horse race. Yep. You have to have a long perspective and know that, you know, relationships with brokers, with uh, lenders, with property managers, with investors, all that, you know, someone someone can say no, you know, five times in a row. And then that sixth time that you show them a deal, you know, they may be your biggest investor, but you got to yep. have that perspective of it. it's a long horse race. It's going to take time. Yep. And you can't, you can't quit when you hit those bumps. If I had quit then, like when I had that moment, um, I was you know, a month out from finding that next deal, which changed my entire life and right. put me on the map, that 96 unit deal. That yeah, which I, we're going to talk about here shortly. Which we're going we're to get to that. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be, it's a really interesting deal. You actually house hacked it while you were in college, Yeah, but that's coming shortly. So one of the things that we talked about at lunch that I can definitely relate to is, you know, you started out syndicating with virtually no money, mm -hmm. no experience, and they were able to build kind of your track record, your experience and your liquidity and your net worth. And to now where you're actually interested in going back and doing more direct ownership where you own the majority. Yep. So explain that to the audience and walk them, you because know, most people are like, oh, I really want to get into syndication, you know, and they're flipping or they're wholesaling or whatever. They're like, sure. they view like this holy grail of like multifamily syndication. And I really appreciated your perspective that we talked about and just the full transparency of what it's like to be a syndicator when you have multiple people, what it really looks like, all that stuff. So talk about kind of your progression from syndicating to now kind of looking back and saying, hey, there might be maybe a better structure for me as I move forward and grow. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've been through syndication is how I got started. I had no other option. I mean, it was out of necessity. I had no money. Uh, if I had money, I would have bought my own deals. Um, but, uh, I had to do it. And so my first $7 million property I bought was absolutely 100% no money down, not even the earnest money, anything. I just didn't have it. And so I found other people that could put it up and they right. came in on the deal with me and that's how we structured it. Um, but now, you know, I've, I've realized as I've built liquidity and net worth, um, you know, I, I bought a deal last year, a 20 unit deal, um, that within six months has added a half a million dollars to my net worth. And, uh, I make 40, $50,000 a year cash flow on it. Um, and you know, I own a majority of it mm -hmm. and I didn't, I barely had to put any money in. Mm -hmm. I still split some with investors, but I mm -hmm. JV'd it. It was a mm -hmm. smaller deal, but it's not like a 150 unit deal you know, which I've done where I own 10% of, I make more on a 20 unit deal than a 150 unit deal just cause, and I own more of it. So my philosophy now is like, um, you know, I would, I would rather do structured deals the right way where I have more ownership and I put more of my own money into them now and more control. And I think part of that, uh, also adds into, you can get a little bit more creative when you own the deal and there's less people involved. When I have 25 investors on a deal, I'm, I'm stuck to the structure I set up from the beginning. Mm -hmm. If I'm telling you it's a three to five year sale, I'm going to do that, right? If I buy a deal on my own or I JV it, I have more flexibility to say, maybe I want to refinance in two years or maybe I want to take the cash flow and pay it off or maybe I want to just flip it and sell it. But I can do that, you know, at my own leisure, more control. I mean, it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. You know, like 
the times that I've just had one partner and we go into a deal and we're like, oh, you know what? We discovered this other kind of nugget that we didn't realize and we can add washers and dryers. Yeah. We could add a playground. Yeah. We can add more units. Yeah. We can build out the basements, whatever it is. It's like a one phone call and it's done. Yeah. And then, yeah, we went over budget a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, but we increased NOI, you know, uh, you know, we doubled it, 100%. you know, by adding some of those amenities but, and, and maybe seeing some value versus when you do a syndication, you know, those legal docs and those sub docs tell you almost everything that you yeah. can do and can't do. And you don't follow those, like you said, or you need to, a capital call or something. Sure. I mean, the deal goes sideways yeah. and you'll have all kinds of headaches. Yeah. And I, that that's definitely something that I miss, you know, is just having, you know, full, full control and being able to like make decisions on the fly that make sense, maybe more today than when you bought the property and being sure. able to be flexible, be creative, be more entrepreneurial yep. and maybe, uh, you know, uncover some added value. But I do think that there are some massive benefits to syndication, like you spoke about, you know, when you're starting out, you're using other people's money, they're paying you some fees. You know, one of the biggest reasons that I went away from direct ownership, you know, and I'd have tremendous success with several of my really close friends and, and business partners. And, you know, we totally crushed it, but we were working like crazy. You know, I was doing everything. I was sourcing the deals. Yep. We were putting in the capital. Yep. I was the GC. You know, I was overseeing property management. And now, you know, with syndication and being able to leverage my track record, my experience, and, you know, my ability to source build deals team, and execute. And build, I've been able to build a team. And yeah. you know, we have a full-time analyst, you know, full-time nice. director of operations, full-time GC. We have a project manager. You know, now I have five or six super talented people to help me run the company, which is what has allowed me to create more content, yeah. build relationships with people like you, work on a bunch of media stuff with Chris. And, you know, and for me, it's been life changing, you know, yeah. being able to go from, hey, I own 100 percent of this deal. And, yeah, I just made X number yep. of dollars and got to take all the depreciation and call the shots to, you know what? I own a little bit less. You know, um, I probably have been able to structure something more favorably than other uh, syndicate yeah. just because of my background and because sure. I came with more capital. Do but you it's, still put money into your deals. Oh, too? for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We put between five and 10 percent. Okay, nice. Yeah. That's what I do. Um, so, yeah, we like to have. But you know, it's allowed me to hire really talented people that has really given me uh, the optionality to choose what I'm going to do now. I don't have to wake up and solve all the problems. We have people to solve the problems and now I can focus on more opportunistic things, more entrepreneurial things like, you know, podcast, you know, like writing the book, doing, you know, so all these things. And Love that. so, but I think that you're in a great spot, you know, where you've, you, you can kind of still do both. You can do both. You can do both. And you can do direct. Ar yeah. The argument for syndication is it's free equity. Whether right. you're putting money in the deal or not, you're getting a piece of equity without having to put a dollar in to right. get that. Yeah. Right. And so uh, that's where my first couple of deals, I mean, syndication is great. Yeah. I'll never, you can't, I, right. you can't downplay it. Right. I made yeah. my first seven figures syndicating deals yeah, right. and, and it's powerful. Um, so for people that don't have capital or don't have all the capital, I mean, syndicating is definitely the way to go. And I Sorry. think that's yeah. an important message here. I mean, a lot of times, you know, if people are out there listening to podcasts and Googling things, they, they get focused on, no, this is the one way I need yeah, to go out there right. and do this. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I've got to syndicate. Yep. I've got to flip. i got to house hack a fourplex. Yep. There is no one best way. It depends on the market. It depends on the lending environment. And just depends on what your situation is. Like yep, you're saying, right. hey, you syndication, that was the most logical thing for you. I had to. Makes sense. Well, you had to. I, uh, I mean, Terrence is a different option. Yeah. If I was going to buy that deals, I had to syndicate. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And I've enjoyed building the team. Obviously, it has different headaches and different... Uh, dynamics to but you know ultimately you know coming from sports i enjoy the dynamic of working with a team especially super talented individuals we're all kind of working towards a common goal sure. i really believe in like you know the team all having upside and aligning interest so there's you know there's pros and cons i you know i it was refreshing to hear your perspective about hey you know i've done syndications i'm trying to do maybe some more jvs strategic uh strategically sure and yeah i'll still do syndications but there's some other options that i really like because sometimes you get into syndication in these circles and it's almost it's cultish. Rah, rah, it's a dude. little cultish. It's like, yeah. oh man, I got 3,000 yeah. units. And it's like, no, dude, you invested $25,000 <laughs> yeah. into seven deals yeah. and you have 3,000 units. <laughs> right. All right. I have 3,800 units. Let's and all relax. Like, yeah, exactly. Let's relax. Did yeah, you right. put the deal together? Yeah. So I don't know. People got to bring it back a little yeah. bit, which is fine. I think it's really cool at the same time. But, you know, I think there's a lot of mis smoke and mirrors. A lot of smoke, a lot and, mirrors. Of smoke right. and mirrors right. nowadays. Yeah. So let's say, hey, I always say, let's see some balance sheets, baby. Yeah. Show me your balance sheet. <laughs> so, um, sound like a banker. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite saying is, let's see the steak, not the sizzle. Yeah, let's that see the steak. That was my very first right. salesman. So you go, he the sizzle? Yeah. And there's steak. Yep. Go for the steak. That's go right. for the steak. I was like, you know what? That's see some substance. Sense. That's right. Let's see yeah. some substance. So moving on to uh, talk a little about that, the first couple deals you put together. Like I think there were a couple 12 units. Mm -hmm. um, you had like a, a, an immediate win, an immediate like learning experience. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll talk about this 96 unit new house hack. Yeah. So uh, really quick, I, uh, I'll talk about the because I bought two 12 units on the same street at the same time. And it was a cool little story because they were complete opposites. Two different brokers. I went under contract on both of them within like a week of each other. It was like I, I put one under contract and then I found the other one. And I'm like, oh, this is on the same street. I'll buy this too from another broker. Um, I didn't have en enough money raised to even buy one from the start. I didn't have any of that lined up. Uh, and one deal went really well and the other went really bad. They were both 12 units. Um, the 12 unit with all two bedrooms, bigger units and should have higher rents actually did a lot worse than the 12 bedroom that had all one bedrooms, smaller units. And the difference is the condition of the property. The 12 unit with the two bedrooms was the bad deal and the one bedrooms was a good deal because the one with the one bedrooms had an owner who owned it for about 20 years. He was a guy that was out there every day picking up trash, took phenomenal care of it, had uh, done some really nice work to the units and, and had a tenants that had been there for five to 10 years on average and they paid their rent every single month. The other one was run by a guy who just kind of bought it and was flipping it or whatever, did not manage it well. Um, had a lot of bad tenants in there, uh, a lot of uh, missed rent, skipped uh, payments and stuff like that. And then it was in really bad condition. And I was none the wiser at the time. I mean, going into it, um, I didn't put enough thought into, you know, the roof. It was a flat roof versus a pitch roof. And the flat roofs are a pain in the butt, especially if they're old. Right. Um, I didn't raise any money to fix the roof. I didn't, I didn't you just think, didn't know to do it. Well, I got it inspected and a guy told me it was in good shape. Like he's like, Oh, you got five years left on it. I'm like, I'm going to sell it before five years. But there, it was like actively leaking. So I was spending hundreds of hundreds of dollars a month repairing drywall and, and patching the roof, uh, because we had all these problems and I'm not the kind of landlord that's just going to allow that to just happen and not fix it, you know? And so that ate up the budget. Um, Tenants, just bad tenants in there. I had to evict like four tenants in the first year. And so I was barely making, you know, I had an 8% preferred return. The other one I was making 10% on. Wow. And the bad deal, I was making like five or 6%. And the only reason I hit 8% uh, was because I went in and started painting units and, and turning and doing turns at where, I, you know, the work I could do. Jeez. So, so you were just, you were, you were buying materials, but free labor, right? Free labor on some of it. I mean, I, I didn't know how to like install vanity or toilet yeah. and stuff like that, but like I was like painting and I would change the light bulbs and I would, um, you know, do the landscaping and stuff like that to keep it cheap. But I, you did what you needed to do to make it happen. That was the thing. Oh yeah. I couldn't, I mean, it was my first deal. There's no, there was not yeah. a scenario where my, where my investors didn't get what I told them there. And that's get. like the right attitude to go in there where it's yeah. like, whether, no matter what happens, you get the damn thing done. Yeah. That was my first big check, and it was like $16,000 acquisition fee. But you were how old? I was 20. 20 years old, and you got a $16,000 acquisition fee. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even know. That was a lot of money to me when 16, I was It was yeah. a lot. I, mean, yeah. I had never seen anywhere near that amount of money. And I had, I, the, like, literally the week I got it, I had to put it right back in the deal. I was like, I, I can't. I because can't you just didn't this. underwrite the construction correctly? Yeah, I didn't. And I didn't budget for a pro, right. or a, a tax and insurance escrow. So my closing right. costs were higher than I thought they should be. Um, you know, so all these things come into play. And I'm like, shoot, I got to put it back in. And so I came and then I went. But what a great learning lesson, yeah. though. Oh, dude. It was amazing experience. I self-managed them, too. I only yeah. charged a 4% fee when I should have charged like 10%. Again, just to get the investors just their craft. Done. That's right. Just and I ended done. up, I sold them within two years, and I made them I, I be the expectations I set for them. They did what we did well. Um, and then, you know, on to the next deal. And so. did you make some money there when you sold those? Yeah, I made like 30, 30 grand, 40 grand. Yeah. I, I want to roll back a few sentences with you, Dave. So you made that $16,000 check, and then five days later, you're writing it back in. Dude, right away. What was your, your ad? Because I imagine your emotion was, hell yeah. Hell yeah. But when you're writing that check, I mean, that's not a hell yeah. What was your mindset like to where you could, you know, take that in stride and just say, you know what? Yeah. This part of the game, like, what were you telling yourself? What was your mental Dude, game? Back to ramen noodles, man. No, uh, <laughs> you know, it, honestly, um, to me, it was just part of the process. I'm, I'm a very like, I don't, I don't overthink things. I don't hang on to things. Like, if something bad happens, the next day I forget about it. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just like, I was like, this is what I have to do. I'm gonna, ma I'll make it back in the future. It's coming. 
just I gotta be I gotta be patient. Because you'd probably you know at that age you'd probably already thought about where you're gonna spend the sixteen thousand. Oh right? yeah, you probably dude, had it like already I, I, oh, spent. Yeah. You probably had spent twenty thousand, <laughs> and, <you're>, and <laughs> then you had to write it back. That probably had to. It probably felt like Could twice as painful. Oh, thank God, I was living with my parents and I wasn't spending a ton of money. Nice. And but I probably would have, yeah. you know. So um, right. it, it 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 worked the way it should have in the end, and and it all came out okay. Okay, so you do two twelve units. So what point? Because I know mentorships played a big part mm-hmm. of your career. So at what point did you get a mentor? Then was it after those twelve units? Uh, when did you join that? I guess I had a couple mastermind. Yeah, I had one in single family. I I joined the mastermind at that point. So um, after you purchased them, you joined the mastermind. Yeah, it was right around that same time. So that's what I was gonna. That's right. I t- I totally forgot. That's what I was gonna use my acquisition fee for was to join the mastermind. Okay. I put Rod on a credit Cleaves card. Mastermind. Yeah, Rock right. I put on a credit card and then I had to put the money back in the deal. I couldn't. So, um, uh, yeah. And so that mastermind was huge. I met a guy that I ended up buying five six hundred units with, Clayton Gonzalez, great mentor of mine. Um, he owned about three hundred million dollars in real estate in Texas. That's the reason I moved from Michigan to Austin. Um, oh, was him? Yep. Was him, to work closer with him? Yep. Exactly. And you met him through this mastermind. I met him through the mastermind. Wow. It was like a year later that we ended up partnering. I had done a co- I met him. I had continued doing deals in Michigan, and then like a year and a half later, we met up in another mastermind, and we're like, dude, let's buy some deals together. And so that's what we did. So what did Very you do cool. with the masterminds? Because I'm again spending twenty grand can go, you know. Yeah. Uh, go really good or really yeah. bad. And I hear a lot more horror stories and success stories. A lot mm-hmm. of times it comes to people, you know, hey, you spend it, yeah. but you did certain things in the mastermind group that led to being able to partner with a mentor one day. Like, yeah. what'd you do to get your money's worth and then, you know, get a hundred X multiple on that? I mean, I was 21 years old. I was the least wealthy by far, smallest. I mean, the average ownership in this group was like a thousand to 2000 units. So a lot of these people, and these were all like sponsors, not like I own, you know, not just saying they own a thousand to 2000 units. And yeah, so this is a heavy hitter group. Then. Yeah, it's a heavy hitter group. There's dude. a lot of very, very wealthy, like, yeah. like, you know, people, there are several people in that group with 10 to $20 million net worths and more. Yeah. Um, and so I was by far, you know, youngest and smallest. In that so group. how did you get it? Yeah. How did you even get in that group? Uh, I was, I had become good friends with Rod. Oh, you he had? had me on his podcast and he's like, dude, I'm going to come in this group and oh, start cool. it up. So I was one of the kind of the founding members. But he still made you pay the full fee. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I got to, no, I paid him over of, time. I paid him more over time. Oh, cool. More over time. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, he yeah, was yeah. doing still a really, yeah, he, you he a hooked, big favor. He hooked me up. Yeah, he hooked, he hooked up, me yeah. up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it just being around people like that for me and I just was like absorbing everything and learning. And then, but with a lot of them, a lot of the people in the group, they really liked for me, they got a lot of underwriting tactics and knowledge and they saw that, you know, I was good in, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, a lot of synergies with people in that group and I just learned a ton and absorbed, built some good relationships. And I have a lot of mentors in that group just because people saw that I was actually putting in the hard work and, and willing to do like whatever it takes to get it done. And I had bought a couple of small deals at that point. So, you know, I, I think that people who have, you know, are older and have been in this business for a long time naturally like helping younger people out. That's what I found. A lot of people have, always, you know, always been like, oh man, I would say like starting young. I mean, it must have been super hard. Honestly, I feel like being young has been my biggest advantage. You know, not having a mortgage, not having kids, not having, you know, all these the responsibilities. Responsibilities yeah, like huge. I, do, I had all the time in the world. That's why yeah. I was working 90 hours a week because I had the time to do it. And I was living off of like less than a thousand dollars a month, you know, my f- whole first year. Yeah, I think that's one of the really impressive things. And I think something that the audience can really tangibly take hold of and try and apply to their own life is that what other people thought was, was like uh, going to be a hindrance for you or a weakness your age, yeah. your inexperience, you know, you think that you've turned it around and it's become like one of your biggest strengths, you totally. know? And so, you know, whatever your perceived weaknesses and whatever situation you're in, in real estate, whether it's capital, it could be experience, could be your network, could be your market, it's too hot or it's not large enough or whatever in between is find a way to turn that around and take that weakness and turn it into a strength. You know, it's all comes down to perspective, right? Perspective and attitude. Positivity is power, man. That's right. Yeah. That's a Rod Cleave saying right there. Is it? You had to get that from Rod. Yeah, for sure. I must have. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to have him here. I can't wait. I mean, he's, he's going to teach dude. me a ton. Yeah, he's, dude, his energy is phenomenal. I can't wait to have him here. It is. And uh, cool. So I love that story of mentorship. You know, this show, the Tribe of Multifamily Mentors, we're really trying to focus on that. We're trying to highlight stories of people like yourself, maybe a little bit younger, less experience, you know, kind of David versus Goliath overcoming all these major odds and obstacles and, and, um, 
you know, challenges that come along the way and being able to make it in the multifamily game. So I think that's co- really cool. That's really what this show is about is highlighting, you know, kind of that whole, whole situation. So now let's get into, let's get into this 96 unit house hack. Yeah. Your first large deal. Yep. You're a junior or senior in college at this point. Yeah. I think it's my senior year now. Senior year in college. You've got two 12 plexes. One's going well, one's not going so well. And you're like, screw it. I'm going to add a zero and go buy a 96 unit. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'd I'd been sending mailers out for a couple months and it was only like three or four months into sending mailers to apartment owners from like a co-star list that I had this guy from Miami call me and I didn't really realize how successful he was at first, but turns out he owned over a billion dollars in real estate on his own, like no partners, like baller. Um, He owned 3,500 apartments free and clear. And the one I had- insane. (laughs) Yeah. Just insane. I mean, just stupid money. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm 21 years old and I, you know, talking to this guy who's just super successful and like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to at the same time show that like I'm qualified and confident to do it, but also, you know, humble enough to say like, I've never bought a deal this big. I mailed him on this 96 unit deal. It was his smallest and it was the first deal he had ever built. He built it 40 years ago and then he paid it off. Um, and so uh, he had his nephew managing it who was doing a terrible job. Uh, the maintenance guy was drunk. The manager was friends Jeez. with all the tenants. And um, <laughs> so they, their rents were really low. And I recognized it right away. And um, and so I was like, I was like, I would love to buy this building. Uh, made him an offer for like $4 million. He was asking four eight, And then I said, okay, I'll do four two. And he really shouldn't, like he shouldn't have come down to that number, but he's like, okay, I'll do it. Um, and I told you guys what I found out later after I met with him after I closed on the deal. He's like, I didn't need the extra couple hundred thousand dollars. I just, I liked you. You reminded me of myself when I was your age. It's incredible. Yeah. And so that's how I got in, in, you know, under contract on that deal. So you go under contract, you didn't have, I mean, how much money did you have your name at that point? Did you even like, how did this you do like any earnest money? Five months after I bought those 12 units. So you had no bad. money still. No, I still had no money. No money. You had just raised what? Like no, I might have had to put back for, into the You're probably deal. still yeah. painting units yeah. at yeah, this I'm point, still pa- right? Yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, I was literally still painting units, yeah. Unbelievable. So <laughs> it's crazy. you find this deal. This guy in Miami owns 3,500 units, free and clear. So he's obviously super experienced. Yeah. You're on the other side of the spectrum with very little experience. He takes a liking to you. You go under contract. And then what? how do you come up with the earnest money? Oh, and he gave me no financials. He only gave me a rent roll. He said, I won't give you a T12. Right. Which is crazy. I had to make a T12. Why is that? Was that him just part of like? Or he's probably old school. He yeah, probably didn't old have a T12. School. He's a yeah, classic, yeah. dude. He's like, they, look, I make they, a lot of money every month. I don't need a. I never really found out paper. if they had one or not. Uh, what I ended up doing, and it actually really pissed him off at first, which I think actually helped build our relationship in the end. Um, he wouldn't give me a T12. He gave me a rent roll. I think it was because they don't manage it super well, and he didn't want me to be like, oh, it's like a six cap on paper, which th- f- three years ago, six cap was like a crazy price, right, in Michigan. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I actually, he, I was put in touch with his team that man, they self manage, right? And so I was put in touch with his team, and I actually got on the phone or had emailed back and forth with some of his team. I was like, hey, can you at least tell me like what your insurance are and your taxes <laughs> are and your utilities, so at least I can like put a budget together. Right. And he found out about it, and uh, he actually sent me like a really like a, a, a angry email. Not, he didn't like right. He's like, he's like, I told you I wasn't going to share financials with you. Like, like you went behind my back and talked to my team about this, and like I had no ill and will. I just needed something to give. Friends Max, so I can get a loan. That's right. I yeah. just need a couple numbers. You need a few data it's points. It's not going to change my yeah. offer to you, right. man. But I like I saw that, and I don't know most. I don't know what most people do, but this is what I did. I called him immediately, picked up the phone. I said, "Dude, I apologize. Like, I'm just trying to get this for whatever." And I was so intimidated. I was like sweating because this right. dude is like could crush me. <laughs> and but he's a good dude, and he was like, I think he appreciated that I picked up the phone because he's old school. I called him right away. We settled it. He knew, he figured out why I was asking for the stuff. And after that, like, I think I I gained some more respect in his eyes and we actually built a really good working relationship. We were talking a couple times a week over the next few months as I bought the deal. So, so talk about though, the, the raising capital, because I think it's a deal you told us about lunch. You said this was the hardest uh, money you've ever raised, right? Was it that deal? Yeah. It was just the hardest thing in general I've ever done in my life. So this particular deal, raising the money was the hardest thing you've ever done? Ever. Literally ever. Wow. Yeah, it was it was excruciating. I mean, imagine I had only raised three hundred thousand dollars at that point, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and which is I had, still very impressive for a 
20 year old which 19 what are you how old are you then? i was then? 20 i was yeah. 20 21 yeah yeah and you know which i felt great about that I've, I, but now it's one seven it's like this is a lot i don't That's know the money people. you had to raise was one seven i don't know anyone that has 1.7 million and what was the earnest money um it, it must have been like 25 up front and then another like 75 i after think after 30 days or something like that so how'd 50, you come up 50. with the 25 so the guy that was getting the same guy that signed on the loan for the first two deals brought that um Cool. And then, uh, but actually between me and him couldn't qualify for the loan. So we had a third guy come in that had about 3,000 units locally. And that was kind of the saving grace at the end of the deal. Because he came in, he invested some, and he brought a couple of his friends for like 500 grand. And that got us to the finish line. But I mean, dude, I, had, I had to have talked to hundreds of people, 150 people about investing. Well, who were you calling? Like you, like who, who are the 150 people you called? Anyone. I literally sat down for hours and just wrote down a list of like anyone in my life. I knew that money. I would talk to my parents, like, who do we know that has money? And I, was, <laughs> I would go to friends and then people that invested in my first deal. I'm like, dude, tell me anyone, you know, who you think is like rich. And when you're talking with these, I mean, cause I remember when I was, you know, 20, 20 when first getting the sales yeah. and I, I was selling, you know, a hundred dollar to five hundred dollar products yeah and that was intimidating as a 20 year old talking to 30 40 year olds yeah here you are you know looking to raise millions of dollars i just imagine that so much more intimidating yeah like i imagine like what what were you saying to people Dude. like or it, do you even remember oh no i do remember at, at first i know why it was so hard is because i started with the wrong structure change the structure so and the then, wrong financial structure. The wrong, so yeah, give the an wrong example. split with yeah, the investors. Give the, yeah, give an example. So let's say I did like I really a, enjoyed talking yeah, with you about Let's this. say I did like a 6% preferred return and like a 60-40 split with investors, which at the time syndications are a little less common, but that's that's kind of an aggressive structure that's for someone a someone with a lot of experience with a juicy deal. Correct. A, a juicy ton of deal. experience. Yeah. yeah. And with, Exactly. And so, you know, this ended up being an extremely juicy deal, but at the time it like we didn't know the market would appreciate that much, right? Um, and so you know, I had to switch it to an eight pref 70, 30, and that made it a lot more palatable for investors. But I was also trying to hard sell investors. And on top of that, I didn't have a pitch deck, which now we have really beautiful pitch decks to sell deals. I, I was sending investors a Dropbox link with photos, my Excel underwriting, and then like a PDF that had like a one or two page summary. So much harder to digest for oh investors. Oh my gosh, dude. Nobody opened you're it. Right. Nobody. And, then, and there was no reason. Was- you're, sitting, you're sitting there waiting. Did they open, did they open it? No. I'm like, why is nobody getting back to me? It's because they're not opening the freaking documents. And I halfway through, I'm like, duh, marketing, like, which naturally isn't my thing. But I put together this nice, nice, but nicer PDF and then send it. And now I'm getting responses. Um, I do remember, but also I was hard selling people. I was like, dude, this what is What do you great, mean hard selling? Like car sales, not a car salesman, but like in between, right? I wasn't like, I wasn't like here's this deal. One. If you're interested, let me know, which now it's more like people kind of come to me. Bef- but then it was like, no, you should totally come to this deal, like following up with them aggressively. And people in investments do not want to be hard sold. If you are trying to hard sell people on investing $100,000 with a 21-year-old- with They no get tracker, scared. Yeah, they get, they get scared. scared. Right. So- that I turn off a lot of people with that. Um, and that was another learning experience. And so you pivoted more towards what, like just more relationship style? Relationship style, selling on the logic of the deal. I'm buying it for this. Here's other properties I've sold for this. Here's the rents. I'm going to take the NOI from here to here, showing them a very logical approach, which maybe they didn't really even understand it if they're not in the industry, but they could see it's well thought through plan and it makes sense. Um, and it just, I think, took time to get in front of the right people. I, I do remember having a uh, sit down with three doctors. Um, one, I was talking to one doctor and he's like, oh, I've got a couple of buddies. Let's go out to you know dinner or whatever. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll take you. He picked like the nicest steakhouse in town. Um, and you Park, had to pick up the Birmingham. tab, right? Oh, yeah. And this was, I maybe had a couple thousand dollars in my bank account. No joke, like four grand, three, four grand. And I spent a thousand dollars on this meal with no these guys. No way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? I spent a fourth of the money that I had. <laughs> And but they invested. Oh, they did. I oh, locked cool. up three hundred grand. Oh, nice. Hundred each. That's cool. And so um, that it was to worth feel it. a little bit better. It was worth it. Yeah. So uh, and then you know it, I had a guy that said he was going to commit to five hundred thousand dollars, and he backed out last minute. Who knows if he even had it? But you know he's one of those guys that like talked a big game. Um, I've had that happen a bunch. That's painful. Yeah, that happens a lot early on, especially with people you've never worked with before. Right. You get commitments, they back out, and so. You always got to have a pipeline. You got to back up. Yeah. yeah. So just learn them all these things. It's like, okay, step one, have a nice presentation. Step two, don't hard sell. Uh, show the facts. 
Step three, you know, probably have a list of investors before you go into a deal. Um, and so they're just all these little things. I, I don't expect people just because they say they're going to invest. Do not expect them to invest. Raise, yeah, get right. more commitments than what you need. It's easier to tell someone no than to not have enough to or to just carve them back. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, okay, so you spent how? So because I remember you talked about like you had what three extensions, so you couldn't yeah. raise the money. So you're calling. So instead of like emailing the guy or going dark you know, you're picking up the phone again i was talking about all the time calling the seller explaining the situation yeah. i really love that you know walk through maybe your mentality about the transparency when things were going bad i mean you know, with the seller yeah because i was talking to him like you know a couple of times a week when i picked up the phone and told him something went wrong I, we just had a really good report at that point and he's like okay i'll work with you it wasn't like we were harboring bad feelings against each other and going through just through emails and he's like well i screw you why did you, did you tell me but um, we had good rapport, so he extended it. it. Took us like six, five, six months to close, um, and then we finally got it done. So your earnest money. At what point did it go hard in here, or did it go hard? Because I'm, mean, hey, I've extended. Yeah. Did you make your earnest money go hard? So I think it was twenty five. It was. It must have been like fifty thousand. It was refundable through due diligence. I had a due diligence extension. So I first that was in the contract. I used that, and then it went hard after sixty days, and then I had to put another fifty. So it was like a. It was like a hundred hard at some point, and I still didn't have all the money raised. So a hundred hard of someone else's money. Yeah. While you're still raising the yeah. the balance. Yep. That's yep. a little stressful. It was extremely stressful. Yeah, it was tough. And yeah. to date, that was still the most difficult thing you've ever done, raising that one point seven. One hundred percent. Okay, so super tough. so you get the you get the one point seven. You own the deal. Yep. Or walk us through kind of how management went, how the renovations went, and how, and how you house hacked it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uh, I always wanted to house hack a deal. I was like, this is the time to do it. <laughs> it was in a nice enough area where I was like, okay, I'll li- I'm cool living there. Um, it was like, it, it now it's probably like a B, B minus. It was at the time probably like a C plus area. Um, the tenant base was definitely C, C minus. Um, and, and what market was this in? Uh, Southfield, Michigan. It's called So, so, so another deal it's in Michigan. 20 minutes north of Detroit. Okay. Yep. yep. And uh, another deal in Michigan. And the rents were like... 650 for the ones, 750 for the twos. Um, I moved on site uh, a couple, probably a month or two in. I took a two bedroom. I like tricked it out, and then I actually paid. I paid a high rent because I wanted to show on a rent roll that I could get a really high rent. So I paid 1,200 dollars. I spent like 12 grand renovating this unit. I paid 1,200 bucks on the unit, um, so that when I sold it, I could show. A, I knew I could. Sh- uh, yeah, every hundred bucks is probably worth 20 grand. Oh yeah. yeah, so I could show a buyer too. I was like, oh, you could yeah. do this and then rent this out for more. Um, but, uh, yeah, I moved in and I, and then I figured out that was when I first started managing employees. I had, I inherited the onsite, a full-time manager and a full-time maintenance. And the maintenance guy was a drunk and he was BSing me on every, everything he told me. And I was gullible. At that. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. I was like, why aren't these things getting done? You know, nowadays I'd be like, well, that guy just sucks. That's why it's not getting done. But How long time, did it take you to, re- to learn that? And three realize months, that? probably. Two, three months. Because um, they're looking at you like, oh, here's this young kid that says he owns his yeah. place. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to fix any toilets yeah, today. Yeah, exactly. And so he wasn't doing much. And the the manager, I was like, these rents are like 650 for a one bedroom. It's crazy. Next door, they're charging 800. It's like, you need to get the rents up. And she's like, I can't do it. Nobody's, t- nobody's biting. And I'm like, you are just a bad manager. So I was so nervous when I went into fire. Uh, well, I, separately, I fired them. But I was, it was... Uh, like you same know. time. I was so though. young and they're Probably both really twice my age. Right. And I was uncomfortable. But I fired them, hired new people. Uh, another three months later, four months later, the second manager, I, I actually got a maintenance guy. The second maintenance guy was amazing. So good. In fact, when I sold that property two years ago, he moved from Michigan all the way down to Texas. And he's my head maintenance guy at another one of my properties nice in word. Fort Worth. Oh, wow. And I love relationships. The guy. Relationships, yeah. dude. He's, he's like, where you go, I go. I'm like, so he was that good. Oh, you guys so stayed in touch. Good relationship. Great that you, brought, you flew, you Mark. moved him down to Fort Worth. Yeah. I love it. Great, dude. dude that's really cool. Yep. It was the same thing. When we opened up Des Moines, I took my main GC from Denver that had been with me for three or four years, and he started helping me do all the construction he on moved our project over. in Des Moines. That's awesome. Yeah, same, wow. same thing. Yeah. You Good have people. to have those core guys uh, on the labor side to run, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, to, to make, Amen, that's where dude. the value is created. Amen. You so treat I love people that. well, and they'll treat you well. Yeah, that's so. right. Yeah. That manager, the second manager, she quit like in the morning of, she texted me like 6 a.m. She's like, oh, I, you know, I quit. I'm, you know, I'm going somewhere else or whatever. I don't know. It's some stupid story. So I didn't have a manager. It wasn't a big enough property where I have like a backup. I don't have a property management company that can take one of their floats. I was the property manager. 
And so I, I step in and now I'm the on-site manager for like three months until I found somebody else. And so I took that time to like get super organized, get our software all in check. I used Appfolio. Um, I took the time to get all our billing and I made systems around everything in marketing. Uh, and I leased units at like really high rates. I took the ones from 650 to 900. Wow. Uh, with a $5,000 renovation. I took the twos from 750 to 1100. Jeez. Yeah. And so and now- you're doing the leasing and the marketing yourself. So yeah. you're posting the pictures, oh, meeting with the- Prospective tenants. Everything. Yeah. Were you turning something into yourself? Do we still? No, you... I had a crew. Okay, I hired so you had a crew. A... Yeah. Um, we did about a half million dollar renovation. I GC'd that as well. That was my first project I ever, besides the smaller ones. Um, but now I hired a manager and nobody can tell. You can't tell me that you can't do it because I did it. Right. And you can't tell me that you can't get 1100 because it's, it's doable. I proved it. And so I hired someone and then I brought, she's a lot better. And, uh, and, and now the systems were in place for it to be run, run smoothly. I think that's a massive learning lesson and action point, you know, for everyone listening is that you rolled up your sleeves, got your hands dirty yeah. and figured out how to do maintenance, how to do the leasing, the marketing got really organized. I mean, just the fundamentals, you know, now, when you go buy a property, 100, 200, 300 units, you can speak to anyone in the office there that's working on the property management side and speak directly to what they're doing, how maybe to improve it, help solve some problems because you've done it. I mean, I'm the same thing. You know, like we had to fire two or three property managers. We owned 100 and some units and they were not collecting rent. They're putting the wrong tenants in. They were way overpaying for maintenance, you know, just kind of like calling out of the phone book. No one in, you know, didn't have an on a set yeah. plumber and electrician, you know, the, the things that normal they weren't like bidding it out. Exactly. Yeah. They were just, you know, just trying to solve the problem as quickly as possible. And so by learning that, I learned the hard way that you have to really get into the weeds on all those details yep. on construction. You have to be on site. You have to inspect everything. When it comes to property management, you have to be really, you have to know the rents in the you area. Do. You have to be, you know, very thorough in reading through the application process for screening new tenants. I mean, all these little details is where the money's made. Yep. And I love that you, you experienced that, yep. you know, I mean, that's probably changed. That's probably added so much value to your investors and your deals. Those three, four, five months that you were doing every, every piece yep. of property management. Yep. And I'll never do it again. It made me hate property management, right. but now I can talk to a manager and say, and you know, I it. understand, yeah. you know, it. I've done your job. That's right. You know, so it was a good, uh, it was the best experience I've ever had. I wish I lived in there longer. I sold it after about 18 months. How long did you live there? Uh, for a, a little over a year. Okay. Yeah. So you're doing the renovations, you're GC in it, you're leasing these units, then you hire this manager mm -hmm. and you took, so you took the ones from 600 to 950? Yeah. So I what is that? 350? So it's like you increased rent 60%. A lot on that. Yeah, that's a lot. 350 of, on, out of 600. Yeah. Something like that. 50, 60%. Yeah. You increase the rents. Yep. So the NOI is going up significantly. Yep. So walk me through how you went from, you know, turning that property around, increase in NOI, and then when did you decide to sell it and how was that process? Yeah, we bought it. I'll just pull my calculator really quick. I think we bought it. The NOI was like 325,000 uh, divided by 4.2 million. Um, it was like a 7.7 .7 cap. Uh, and then I brought the NOI up to 450,000 and I sold it for uh, seven million set so a 6.4 cap so yeah so bought, bought it for 4.2 4 4 sold it for seven how yep. much did you put into it uh 500 500 so we were all in it like four nine and held it for 18 months yep so 2.1 we took out and then you know we um, almost doubled investors money they got a one seven multiple in then, 18 months yep which is incredible and, and what then, year this is 2017 18 uh i sold it i bought it in 17 sold it in like early 19 wow yeah and that when I sold it, that was like my first actual big check I made. You know, me and me and my partner split like seven hundred grand. Insane. Yeah. And that was what year three of your journey then? Yes, so three, three years of three underwriting, years. ninety hours a week, yep. and you got yep. your first really big yep. win. So I made like twenty grand my first yeah. year. The second year I had the management fees and right. I did have an acquisition fee on that, which was a hundred grand that I got to split with the other guy. Cool. So I made some a little bit yeah. of like fifty, sixty grand the second year, but then the third year big. you had a big win. Yeah. Very cool. So when you exited that deal, then what was your next, what was the next big play for you? Uh, so I started buying some deals in Texas. Uh, and then over the next two years, I bought about 500 units across Texas. Uh, one, I have one deal in Atlanta, 108 units. Um, and then now I build. And how did you, 
So I want to get to that in a second. But how did you make the move, or where how did the decision making go to go from Michigan down to Texas, where you don't know anyone, you don't yeah. live? I mean, what was that? What went into that? So it was my mentor, Glenn, who I met through the mastermind. He lived had lived in Austin for about 10 years. He had a big portfolio in Texas. And I'm like, I, you know, I still am not at the point where I can qualify for these big loans. I still need a partner for that. And that gives some credibility. So uh, we partnered up and we bought that deal that I mentioned uh, south of Houston and that tertiary market. And then we went on and bought a couple deals in uh, Dallas Fort Worth and now Austin. And but the move was uh, dictated because of because of him. I moved because of because of your mentor, mentor that you yeah. met in that mastermind. Because of a mentor. That's cool. Yep. Really cool. And then so I know so you've you've been doing syndications. You've done what, roughly a thousand units? R- right under. R- yeah. Roughly a thousand units. And you have some other cool stuff going on on the software side. Yeah. So let's talk, you know, I know you're really passionate about it and I think it's going to be an insane value add to investors across the spectrum. So talk a little bit about uh, Real Estate Lab. Yeah. So it basically spawned from the spreadsheets that I built to help me underwrite apartment deals. Um, you know, I built a model and uh, a lot of people started asking me if they can get a copy of it. So you just um, built a simple underwriting model? Yeah, it was just an Excel sheet and it had all, really all, all the functionality you needed. The more I looked at deals, the more I added different features and stuff. And I kind of got good at Excel from my internships in college and investment banking where you're working 80 hours a week in Excel. And um, so I built, yeah, I built this good model. People started buying it from me then for like 250 bucks a pop. Wow. And then I had a, a free one that I had thousands of people had downloaded. And so like it, it was over the course, like a year and a half, like 2019, I made $100,000 selling a spreadsheet on the side with like no- <laughs> yeah, I love that. With like no marketing. I didn't spend a single dollar. Um, and so I'm like, dude, this is something people, there's a d- demand for this product. Right. Uh, and so- uh, you know, I decided that software is the way to go. I could do way more with software than I could do with Excel. And so Excel will still be intertwined with it, but what we're going to do is I can have users upload a rent roll and a T12 to the software. It's called Real Estate Lab. Upload a rent roll and T12. It'll read those. It'll pull out the key data, put it into the spreadsheet already for you, save you a lot of time. Um, we're going to be providing data to users where let's say you have a 1970s deal in Des Moines, Iowa. It's 75 units. Uh, we'll say, hey, we recognize that based on our data from other similar properties. We, um, you know, we suggest that you use this set of operating expenses: fifteen thousand dollars for contract services. So you're actually pulling in data that you've aggregated from other, Correct. like other deals that other users have inputted, or you other users, and then and then also APIs from other data companies. Where we're pulling, yes, exactly, Ooh, multiple locations. That is cool. Yes, yeah, being able to help an investor. Either someone super experienced that just has a ton of volume that needs efficiency sure. or someone new that needs maybe the help with someone with more experience. Yep. So being able to tell an investor based on the age of a building, the size of the square footage, the unit mix, all those things and be able to basically spit out information. Use like, these hey, as your projections. Exactly. Use this as the, based on yeah. based on these data points. This is what we think you should expect. I mean, that's incredible value. Yeah. And then next, what you do is you say, send to the financing marketplace and it goes out and you say, I want a bridge loan quote and I want a long term, you know, Freddie Mac quote. Well, it's going to go out to a network of lenders. They're going to send quotes, term sheets. They're going to pop up on your screen and you're going to just press a button. It's going to input those financing terms right into the analyzer for you. And this is all within the uh, the software platform they log into. It's all Correct. It's, it's all, all, on all done from that. I can, I can type and point from there. Correct. Wow. Correct. Yeah. And so you'll be able to create and send LOIs, a letter of intent straight through there, generate reports on the properties you're putting together, um, eat, track it all on a map. You know, it's going to be really clean. So right now I use Dropbox or, you know, I've been in the past used Dropbox to track and we've got just thousand folders and documents. So this will be a new document manager. It's kind of not, I don't want to say a CRM. It's very light, you know, helping you manage your pipeline. Is it more going to be organized like, hey, I got this, I do this deal and it's saved in my user portal like by property address and go back there and revisit it update assumptions send it out do all that so there's going to be a list view and then there's a map view so you actually have a map that you could zoom in all across the united states and say i have like 100 deals in fort worth that i've looked at over the past i could zoom in and i'll see pins with different colors like green will be active deals you're looking at gray will be dead deals that have fallen apart or you know didn't get an offer accepted but i can still go back and look at like what were my rents on this property now i'm looking at a property down the street let me go back and look at what my rents were right over here and i can go into my underwriting on the other deal and look at that and so um you know, it'll, it'll be just interactive, very user-friendly, so you can track your pipeline and look at it. 
And you mentioned at lunch that the genesis of this really came from all the deals that you were looking at last year. And I, you know, I really want you to share that because I think this is another great like learning lesson for the audience is that, you know, sometimes we hear a lot that, Hey, I'm in Austin, I'm in Seattle, I'm in Denver. I can't find any deals. I don't see any deals. And you know, everyone's saying that the market's hot, debt's cheap, rents are going up, people are getting through, you know, the vaccines rolling out. I mean, everything's coming back to life. You know, everything's really, really inflated or, you know, people are getting aggressive. So, what you know? How many deals did you look at last year? How many did you underwrite? How many did you offer on? Like, talk about some of those numbers so the audience can get a perspective. Yeah, I I tracked these numbers diligently, and we looked at 400 deals, right around 400 deals. That's like one over one a day. Yeah, over one a day. Over a one lot. a day. Uh, we underwrote and and when looking at a deal, any anything that either got emailed to me or I reached out on, mm-hmm. um, and so something that fit our criteria. Uh, and then we underwrite over 200 of them. So sometimes right away we'll email back. We'll be like, what's the asking price? And it's like crazy. And I'm like, that's not even worth my time. But then we underwrote of those 400, 200 or just over 200 that actually went through our model and we spent a couple hours underwriting or my underwriter did. Um, and then I would review it and, and then we made an offer on, um, 100, 125 approximately. And I bought three properties. Wow. Yeah. So from looking at 400 to the three, machine. so less than 1%. Yeah. And you really, and so then you saw the value and, hey, I need something to expedite this yep. and help me make these decisions quicker. You know, because when you're looking at that many markets, that many deals, yeah. I mean, I totally get it. But this is where I, I think software, like software is a very sexy thing. It's a very complicated thing. But that right there is where, you know, it's got such potential to be a great piece of software because you're using yourself in like your your day to day process, your day to day acquisitions process, and now you're systematizing it, yep. and now you're able to leverage it. Like, yep. you know, that right there. Hey, cool! It actually, it's not just a piece of software; it's a piece of software that actually works when it comes to like you know the the sales and acquisition yep. pipeline, which makes it you know just just amazing software. It's very niche, right? <clears throat> yeah. It's not like for everyone; it's for multifamily specifically. Uh, but yeah, the goal is to be the only, like, you're going to need a property management software. You probably need something to manage your investors. This is what you're going to use to manage your acquisitions. That's really well said. Cause I know the leaders in the other two. No, but yeah, that's, that's really well you said. Juniper it, right. and, and the syndication pros and that's whatever. Right. And, and then you've got Appfolio, Yardy, Yardy Resmin, yeah. whatever. And this is, fills the gap fill of the gap. underwriting and analyzing really yep. quickly and efficiently. Yep. Yeah. I think that's, so talk to me about when it's coming out and when you think people are going to be able to. Uh, access it and use it and how they find how they find out more information about it. Yeah, we're launching um, end of May, you know, into June 2021. And it's going to be in beta for the rest of this year, kind of MVP stage uh, as we roll out more and more features um, with a full launch anticipated being 2022. Okay. Uh, but it will be available this summer 2021. And how do people find out about it? Uh, realestatelab.com realestatelab.com. It's up right now. They can go in there and register to see when the MVP yeah, comes out. You can res- out. register to get some uh, notifications. Nice. And then uh, along with that company, we also have a community, which we kind of talked about a little bit, real estate community. We've got about 150 members. Um, and are you looking for new members? Yeah. Yeah. Always open to new members. And yeah. how do people find out about that? Same website. Same website. Realestatelab.com. Um, cool. Yeah. We've got a real estate community of multiple awesome. investors. Yeah. So go oh, ahead. I was, I was going to, there's one question I, I want to make sure we ask you. And I mean, you, I mean, we've spent an you know, an hour, you know, we spent all day actually talking with you. I mean, very impressive in entrepreneurship and investing and software and making things happen. What would you boil it down? Like, what would you boil down your superpower to? Like, what are you really good at that's allowed you to do what you've done the last six, seven years? I would say like underwriting and then, you know, I think just in, in like just general business strategy, intuition, structuring deals, like negotiating with people. I, I'm a, I'm a, v- a very analytical person, but I'm also a, ver- a people person. Which is I a think, very rare combination. Yeah. It's I, usually one or the other. I, it is usually one or the other. And so I, you know, and I think, you know, it's, 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 I been think that's helpful. the superpower. Probably. The fact that you can analyze deals and have access to that side of your brain that's very, you know, into the numbers and mm-hmm. in the weeds and kind of an Excel ninja, and then also be able to relate with people. Cause most yeah. of the time, the guy that's really good in the spreadsheet can't raise the money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And isn't going to really relate and have that kind of energy. So I think that's one of the, you know, the, the your ability to be that dynamic, I think has been yeah. really impressive and something I've really enjoyed watching and, and, uh, and getting to know. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? We, they can reach out to you at realestatelabs.com. You're syndicating. Yep. Uh, you will be doing selective opportunistic syndication. So people that are looking to invest can reach out to you there. Yep. Uh, you've got the group, uh, 
the networking group on Real Estate Labs, and you got the software coming out this summer. Anything else uh, you want to leave with the audience? No, I mean, if you want to check out some of my stuff, uh, Real Estate Jedi on Instagram, would love to connect with you. And, you know, don't be afraid to put in the hard work because it's not going to come easy. So wish you all the best of luck and thanks for having me on here. David, you crushed it. It was a real pleasure. I can't wait to have you back to talk about the software once it's rolled out and just to continue to see uh, how, how your journey uh, progresses. Love it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. Join the conversation.